Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our fourth Emerging Ideas event. Uh, my name is Shannon Watson. I'm the founder and executive director of Majority in the Middle. If this is your first introduction to our group, welcome. The goal of Majority in the Middle is to make our political and civic culture better by identifying ways that partisanship and division have become the norm. We're asking a lot of questions about why things are the way they are. We're looking for places where division exists and wondering if it really needs to. And we're hosting a space for people who are interested in politics to gather in the middle without blame for being on one side or the other and without being asked to give up their own beliefs and priorities. Um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation and I wanna thank you all for joining us. I wanna give an extra special thank you to the attendees who are willing to chip in a few dollars when claiming their ticket. Um, I'm not gonna embarrass people by reading their names, uh, but please know that every dollar helps and we absolutely appreciate your support. Uh, a couple of housekeeping points as we get started. You probably already noticed that Zoom is in meeting mode, not webinar mode. So you do have the potential to be on camera or on mic. Uh, so take a second to mute yourself if you haven't already. We're gonna spotlight the speakers uh, so they should be taking up the majority of your screen. So it's up to you uh, whether you leave your camera on or off for this portion. Um, we do encourage social media interaction during the event. Use hashtag emerging ideas. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, and our show our social handles in the chat in case it's hard to find us. Um, our moderator has a handful of questions and then we'll go to audience Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, it's best to put it in the chat. Um, the event is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our brand new YouTube page um, sometime in the near future. Um, we have until 7.30 with our panelists. Uh, that's 8.30 for those of you who are coming to us from the East Coast. Uh, but we'll also be leaving the Zoom room open for half an hour after the event to give you all a chance to network or give feedback or continue the discussion. So let's get to it. Our discussion tonight focuses on the next generation of political activists, voters, and candidates. Less likely to adopt traditional political labels, they are just as engaged and opinionated as generations that have come before them. Our founders, panelists are founders of collegiate groups that work to overcome partisans, partisan divides, elevate civic discourse, and foster relationships. Our moderator for the panel is Boa Zhao, Boa spent the first half of her career as a journalist in Minneapolis, where she covered everything from the mining industry to education to breaking news. Now she's using those skills to help corporations and nonprofits tell their stories. Boa, thanks so much for doing this today. I am so excited to be here, Shannon, and it's really fun to look through all the attendees and recognize the names. So just a quick shout out to Dan and Amber. Thanks for joining us. We are going to hear from two Gen Z leaders working to overcome partisan divides, elevate the discourse, and foster relationships. And there's been a lot written about Gen Z, but some quick facts before we get our conversation started. Gen Z are those born after 1996. I am not among them. According to the Pew Research Center, they are also the most racially and ethnically diverse and best educated generation, and they want a more active government. So how are they going to do it? We are going to hear from our panelists, and I'm excited to introduce them. Bear with me, I want to make sure I get their bios right because they're just amazing. Um, help me welcome Brendan Klein. He is the co-founder of United Politics at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. United Politics is a student organization dedicated to fostering civil, constructive dialogue between Americans of all ideologies. A crowning achievement for their organization was participating in a voter registration coalition alongside the College Civic Engagement Center, College Democrats, and College Republicans to increase voter turnout in the 2018 midterm election. And their work was nationally recognized by the Alden Campus Democracy Challenge for having the greatest improvement in voter turnout out of any participating small private college campus. That is something to celebrate indeed. After graduating in 2019, Brendan served two terms of service as an AmeriCorps volunteer in the Twin Cities. He is now currently studying community organizing and public advocacy through Metropolitan State University's Advocacy and Political Leadership Master's Program. So he's a busy guy. So thanks for joining us, Brendan. Also on our panel tonight is Lucas Langan. Did I get that right, Lucas? Been practicing, good. 
He's a third year student at George Washington University pursuing his bachelor's in Middle Eastern Studies and Criminal Justice, a double major. He currently works for Makwa Global, a Native American owned federal contractor where he specializes in project management, corporate development, and government affairs. Lucas is also a founding member of Left, Middle, Right, an organization based on elevating bipartisan discussion, which we need more of these days. He serves as their head of events and special projects where he seeks to facilitate political discourse on a national and intercollegiate level. In his free time, Lucas volunteers as an outdoor guide at his university. So thank you and welcome again. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get us started, but like Shannon mentioned um, to our audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. This is not one of those, wait till the end, join in the conversation with us. So to get us started, Lucas and Brendan, I think it would be really wise to get us on the same page of how Gen Z is defining politics these days. So Lucas, let's start with you. How does Gen Z define politics? And then Brendan, we'll go to you next. Uh, I think overall, when it comes to Gen Z, there aren't that many inherently differences in the way that they define politics and versus the way that uh, traditional generations might define politics. Overall, it is really just the youth and the younger generation still participating in ongoing political, social, economic, and affairs. Um, so with that, there's a couple of things that I would like, obviously, that they that do differ majorly. And I would say that that primarily resides within uh, their perspectives and approaches that they hold and participation within political issues. Uh, for instance, youth are more than ever uh, ever being involved in, in politics to some degree, whether it's voting, protesting, advocating on social media, the overall awareness and attention that the, under, that the younger generations are giving to political issues are more than ever. Uh, second, uh, the overall rate of consumption of political content is at an all-time high. Consumption through traditional sources, media sources, uh, writing, watching uh, videos, whether that be on TikTok, Instagram, as we were talking earlier, Snapchat, uh, and then consumption through um, uh, the traditional forces, sorry, excuse me. And then also participation on campuses. Uh, so informally via peers, discussion, talking in classes, uh, or formally via the institution. At my school alone, GW's number of students majoring in political science increases every year. Um, take for instance, what you see visibly on campuses. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it would be rare to see a protest uh, and a protest on a college campus. And when you had events like Kent State, you would have a pretty negative uh, institutional response to that sort of thing. However, now, if you were to go on a college campus and you don't see some sort of political activity, then it's, it's rare to see something like that. Really what I'm getting at is that the fundamentals between uh, generations uh, see political issues the same, but rather the participation and the visibility of these issues has been boosted uh, so much that you would be an outlier for not holding some sort of opinion or perspective or at least participating in the issue to some degree. Brendan, thoughts from you? You know, I think it's fascinating. And I think Lucas, I, I agree with a lot of what Lucas said. And what I'll add to that is we have to understand too, you mentioned that, you know, this generation, Generation Z, uh, is anyone born after 1996? I was born in 1997. And so I'm right at the front edge of this generation. I'm only 24. So that means there's technically only about six years of Generation Z you know, people who can actually vote. Uh, and so the way that they express their politics and the things that they care about is gonna look a little bit different related to the power that they have. And so we have this uh, saying at uh, my graduate program that politics is the way we care for each other. And so I was thinking about, well, how does Gen Z communicate how we care for each other. Um, I think what Lucas mentioned, uh, things like protesting and you know, expressing your beliefs on social media, that's something that anyone can do, whether you're a voter or not. So if you're a high school student, uh, I'm from Minnesota, when uh, the murder of George Floyd happened, a lot of high school students were out on the streets marching and protesting and raising their voice because that's how they can express their politics. They might not be able to through the ballot box, but they can raise awareness on social media, they can raise awareness by their just physical presence uh, that they care about things. And so I, I also agree with Lucas too, that we are, as you mentioned, about one of the most educated or will be one of the most educated generations in the history of the United States. And so we have a better understanding too of politics, how we are connected to politics and how we can influence politics. And so I'm really curious to see what the voting rates will be for particularly Generation Z uh, voters and whether it will be historically higher than it has been for previous generations uh, when they were our age. And so I think that's something that I would think about. I think about how we express our politics, that it might look a little bit unconventional, 
Uh, but I think it's also utilizing the tools and power that we do have since we are so fairly young to still leave our imprints and uh, basically our, our ideas uh, with those who do have the power to create uh, systemic change. We talked about Gen Z as a whole now and how they define politics. I'm very curious to learn your stories behind what drew you um, into politics and starting these organizations. Um, Brendan, let's start with you. What made you want to get involved, especially as a Gen Zer? You know, it's probably a series of things. It's in some ways the environment that you grow up in. And so I was very fortunate that uh, my grandparents, um, one of my grandpas was a lawyer. Uh, the other would always cut out newspaper clippings of op-eds and send them to me uh, to read. And I was probably, you know, a middle schooler. Um, <laughs> And my parents would always Did watch. Did you read them? Yeah, I would. Um, just because I, I, I enjoyed it. I love learning about history. And to me, that's something that just was a connection with my grandpa and something we could talk about. And so I, I also remember to like my parents growing up on Sundays, it, it was like, you know, it was like our church was watching me at the press. And so that's something that when I was just eating cereal, you know, you watch and you kind of become engaged with. Uh, and so that's where I think for me, a lot of my political engagement began, which is an understanding of political issues in the world. Um, that continued to evolve as I, you know, continued to grow and learn more about, um, you know, issues that are beyond just my own backyard um, and how I have, you know, a way to at least influence, impact, or express my feelings about those issues. And so I, I would say for me, it's, it was a journey, it still is a journey. I'm still learning about, you know, how I can be politically engaged um, and trying to practice that every day. But I think it really starts with the environment that you're surrounded in and you grow up in. And I think that for me was this the biggest influence. Lucas, how about you? Yeah, I, I would relate to Brendan and a lot of the ways that he sort of initially got drawn into politics and participated in politics, where um, I would separate it. Um, it lines up perfectly with like sort of like when you're in your younger years versus when you, you get older. Um, I would separate it in terms of like internally and externally. So internally, I definitely had a lot of actors in my life. I had my parents, I had my grandparents, I had my siblings who were definitely, they were older than me, they were wiser than me, and they were more politically active with me. And I was really raised in this, this household that reinforced the idea that every individual, every citizen, every person has got a responsibility to be civic to some extent, whether that's voting, being informed, or participating in discussions via protest, at school, PTA, and in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I very much so believed in this notion and I pursued it in very many different categories in school, the organizations I was involved in growing up, or even outside of that with just my friends and just having discussions outside of classrooms with my peers. Um, I definitely always felt the drive to be informed and involved in some way. Uh, and I've never really, really been formally involved with any partisan groups, uh, but I've really found a, a space where I can still be a part of the of bipartisan politics. Um, externally, definitely, I would say that what really jump-started my, my interest, my pursuit of, of coming into the political spectrum and contributing to some capacity was my immediate environment. Um, and so when I, when I graduated from high school and I came to DC, this is very much so a politically active and very much so a politically relevant place where I used to always say my alarm clocks on Saturday mornings weren't my 8 a.m. alarm. It was a protest gathering at 7.30 to march down the street towards the White House. Right. So what I really say is when I was surrounded by this, I, when I was constantly around it, I got naturally drawn into it and, and found myself in a space where maybe I'm not necessarily contributing in partisan politics in some way, but I am contributing in a bipartisan uh, perspective. So. So, Lucas, tell me how that led you to starting left, middle, right. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess ever since I was. Uh, little, I always kind of sought to engage from talking to people from different backgrounds. And when we're little, you know, we're innocent, we're ignorant, and it's it's hard to see that everybody's fundamentally different and that we don't always get along. Uh, but then as I grew older, um, I started to explore sort of these these avenues, these alleys of say like intellectual conversation with people, and it grew ever so much so more like frustrating and and hard to have an engaging and open and an actual developmental and progressive discussion with somebody. Um, when I came to college and I encountered all these people, I initially found it very hard to openly talk about my political views and their political views. Um, and, and over time, uh, I, I learned that if you're just honest, open, respectful with everybody around you, that it's a lot easier to be able to exchange your ideas and opinions. 
And so when I was actually on campus and I started like brainstorming with my friends, I started brainstorming with my peers uh, about these different ways that we could put an organization together. We, we kind of found this, this interesting position where we could exist from all three angles. So um, the same, basically with left, middle, right, we all have the same mindset of elevating with, uh, elevating overall civil discourse, but rather from a fully encompassing platform but not by offering a singular perspective but, and claiming that this singular perspective is objective in nature, but saying about highlighting the three major perspectives, the left, the middle, the right, and sharing the, these perspectives for all people to see and see them all on an, on an equal platform and so that they could be exposed to all three. Uh, the organization, it really, it's only been around for about a year now, ever since I was a sophomore, I joined. And when I became a, um, uh, well, when I initially started, I started in the outreach department, uh, in which I would find writers, organizations, students who'd be interested in writing in a space like this. And I was really overwhelmed with like, the desire that people wanted to get involved and they really wanted to contribute it, which really jump-started the organization quickly from just a GWDC oriented uh, college organization to, and, and to more of a national organization where now we've got partners with more than 60 universities all around the country. Um, and yeah, I, we just really found that people will just jump at the opportunity to participate in a space that's fully encompassing and it equally lays out all these three major perspectives. I wanna, I have some follow-up questions for you, but we just did get a question from Josh that I think is really important um, for both, uh, both, both of you guys. So Josh asked, what would you say to young people that might not have the same family engagement or political influencers that you have in order to remain involved or evolve their political be belief system? That's a really awesome question. Um, who wants to take that first? I can try. Um, I appreciate that question from uh, Joshua because I, I work with high school students um, these last two years who come from families that either are you know, recently arrived in America. So their familiarity with the American political process is maybe not as ingrained as it was for me growing up. And so uh, there's kind of two, two trains of thought that I have. There's more of an individual uh, responsibility that a person can have to become involved. But I think there's also then a community responsibility that we also have to invite people into the political process. So individually, uh, I think it starts with just being you know, very conscientious about uh, how politics is involved in your life. Um, so I think a lot of times people might think they're apolitical, they're, they're non-political, uh, and that politics doesn't impact them. When in a lot of ways, you know, politics is seen on your commute to work when there's a pothole on the road, um, because that's you know the government that will take care of that pothole to make sure that you don't get a pop tire. And so I think when you can help distill it down to like this is what government can be in its smallest and most directly impactful form. Uh, and you can't take the time to recognize that and analyze that. Uh, I think you'd understand why then your voice and your engagement can help create that change. Um, and I think there's also been good evidence too that being active, being loud, and being engaged can make a difference. Um, I think that's been something that for our generation maybe hasn't always been the case. Uh, an interesting uh, kind of fact that I looked up is you know Gallup has conducted a poll. Uh, every year to measure uh, the American public's confidence uh, in the U.S. government's ability to, you know, steer the country in the right direction domestically. Uh, for the last 10 years, it has never been over 50 percent support. And so we've grown up in this era where the public is more, views the government more unfavorably uh, in our lifetime. It's never really viewed it favorably. So a lot of times people might feel disengaged from politics because they feel like, what's the point, right? <laughs> Government's not going to do anything. They're just going to undo everything that the other party does. So why try? And I think luckily, uh, these last, actually these last two years have provided some really great uh, pieces of evidence that standing up and joining in, whether it's individual effort or a mass movement, can make a difference. The second thing I want to touch on, though, is I think it is a civic responsibility of our leaders, our public leaders, to understand who is not in this conversation, who is currently someone that I need to represent and listen to that I'm not hearing from, and to reach out and invite those groups in. Uh, so especially for younger people, if you are, say, a mayor of a town and you realize that, you know, say, the amount of young people who voted in that last election uh, was significantly below, uh, say, the rest of your population in that town, 
you should, out of hope of creating a more robust and engaging civic environment, make efforts to reach out to young people, see what issues they care about, go meet them where they're at. Because um, I think a lot of times we expect citizens to go to the government um, and basically make their vo voice heard. But I think we should also try and focus on the inverse narrative that the government should really go to the people and engage them. Because uh, I think once you have more of a more of a fam familiarity with government, I think you're, you're more likely to engage. And so that's something that I'm thinking about, especially as I talk to my students, as I think about my involvement is how can we, you know, as civic leaders, invite other people into the conversation? Lucas, thoughts from you? Yeah, I really agree with a lot of things that Brendan was saying. Um, from uh, take from one, one uh, perspective, the individual focus that it really, uh, you know, a lot of the times it does take an individual to be motivated to be to care about issues, to take the time to sit down and independently research these topics and and read about it and and to and to absorb all of these different news sources that are being thrown at them and to look at them objectively and be like, okay, hey, okay, so now I've got these four articles and these four articles are saying. The same thing well they're saying slightly different things about the same thing but how am i going to look at this and analyze it um so really just taking that time to sort of independently go through all of the information that's available to youth and and really developing and formulating their opinions and their perspectives off that because if you're not familiar with the literature then it's hard to develop your opinion in the ways that you actually approach politics um i really liked brendan's point on um, sort of like an institutional or rather more of a leadership responsibility to actually reach out to communities and age groups that don't necessarily traditionally uh, participate in politics. Uh, one thing that we noticed within uh, left, middle, right, the organization I work with uh, was not an intended outcome that we wanted to do with our organization, uh, but it's something that we were actually really very much so quite happy to see. And what happened is we were posting on all of our social media and we found that over 20% of our followers were actually in the age group of 15 to 18. And we don't even necessarily advertise to high school age group. We, high school, we advertise specifically to college age people. But we found that a lot of the people who are actually consuming our media and seeing these three perspectives on all these hot issues were of the younger age group. And that was just sort of an indirect consequence of our platform sort of, you know, being available on, uh, say, tools of transmission that are more accessible to youth. You know, because the youth is more likely to pick up their phone, go on Instagram and look at some of the, the messages, the posts on, and the stories on there than they are to turn on the TV and sit down and watch MSNBC for a night. So I really liked Brendan's point there on talking about how well, uh, there's almost like a, a leadership or an, an individual responsibility in reaching out to these communities and getting people more involved. So based on your experiences, do you feel like leaders are reaching out to young folks who aren't engaged right now to get them engaged? You know, <laughs> Brendan, I'll call on you. <laughs> I'm a hopeful, I'm a hopeful guy. Um, and I, I don't I want to kind of paint in broad, but broad brushes that there aren't any leaders who do. But I would say historically, no. Um, for example, uh, when I was a senior in college during the 2018 midterms, uh, our two local officials uh, did not want to do uh, any kind of um, debates on campus or to host events on campus. Um, in some ways, they were afraid of coming to college campuses and engaging with us in a sense. Um, and, I, and I, my school was in rural Minnesota and it was a fairly liberal campus and we did have conservative representatives. So I understand that it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but the other thing too, is that a lot of them did not want us from actually passing or trying to promote legislation that wouldn't allow us to vote on college campuses that you have to vote back at your home, which for me is Bloomington, Minnesota. And so for me, with that just individual experience that it was hurtful because I thought if you really want to try and engage with us. And if you believe so much in your ideas, then you would want to come talk to us and explain them to us and treat us as equal citizens. But instead, the leaders tried to <laughs> almost like force us to vote elsewhere and not be their problem. And so I am a little disheartened by that. I, I do think though things are changing in, in a generally positive direction. I do think there is now a better understanding, not just for young people, but just for people of all different uh, identities that we need to make sure that we are being really cognizant of who's in this conversation, who's not. You know, politics, for example, uh, we noticed that 
in a lot of our meetings, you know, it was fairly white. And that wasn't satisfactory for us. We want to make sure that we were being intentional about posting topics and including people who had different experiences than me and different experiences than those who were attending you know, politics events because our conversations aren't well served if it's still kind of an echo chamber of whiteness. And so uh, that's something that we were really trying to be cognizant of uh, as our own group about how do we engage with others, how do we invite others into this space, uh, but in an intentional way um, to not tokenize anyone or to make them feel like they are the one representative for, uh, say, someone of their identity, but rather learn about what issues do they care about, what would they like to get from this space, and then how can we make sure that that's possible. And so I think there's a lot of benefit for bringing in young people. We have great ideas, we have a lot of energy, enthusiasm. A lot of us are the backbone behind a lot of political campaigns. I uh, do a lot of the unpaid work. And I think generally our society would be better off if we tried to really just include and energize youth instead of try to disengage them. And then I love that you're hopeful. Lucas, what's your experience been like? Do you feel like leaders are reaching out to young people? And have you had experiences similar to Brendan? Where yeah, I would say- don't want to engage in campus? Yes. Um, I, would, I, would separate, I would separate first um, different kinds of leaders. So we have, um, obviously like elected officials and uh, officials who are officially leading uh, and serving in leadership positions. And uh, a similar experience to Brendan, it almost feels like those people individually themselves are not actually reaching out to the youth. And if they are reaching out to the youth, it's reaching out through through almost like more of like, it almost, it I don't know 100% how to describe that, but it was almost from like a cynical perspective where it's like, if we're gonna reach out to the youth, how can we sort of give them what they want so that they will align their interests with us? Um, and, and on top of that, I would say that the leadership that I do think is, uh, that kind of differentiates specifically Gen Z is that it seems like there's a lot more pop-up leadership where there are people who are serving in these leadership type roles within organizations, um, that didn't previously exist and like not positions that are necessarily official, not positions that are necessarily elected, but positions such as that exist within next gen politics, or it exists within left middle right, or exists with other in all of these different organizations that are popping up on student campuses all around the country. Uh, Turning Point USA, for example, all the, the college Democrat, all the college Republican organizations, and that these leaders are really taking almost like a forefront approach to making sure saying like, hey, like our government, our people aren't necessarily representing all of our ideas, all of our, they're not reaching out to us. They're not involving us in the conversation. Let's start our own form of leadership and let's find our way to actually participate within politics and bring that forward. That's like practicing influencing without authority. I think that's what exactly. you're saying. I wanna go back to um, Lucas, I know you talked about left, middle, right. Brendan, I would love to hear your story of how you started United Politics and would love to hear how that was received on campus. Yeah, be happy to kind of talk about the origin of our, our club. So I was my sophomore year in college, the opinion editor for a student newspaper, and I was about to go abroad. So we were bringing in the next opinion editor. Uh, they and I don't necessarily have the same political beliefs, at least at that time. Um, yeah, the politics maybe changed that a little bit because we started to understand we have a lot more in common. Um, but we both just kind of lamented at how we feel like there's just not a lot of engagement uh, in person about political issues, current issues, current events. Uh, it, it just was a lot through social media and there's a lot of otherization um, where you just, you didn't really get to know the person for who they are on that other end of the conversation. So our, our slogan was burst your bubble and the echo. Uh, bubble stands for your own kind of bubble that you surround yourself with that, you know, you're surrounded by people who kind of, think the same way as you do. You're surrounded by information and media that kind of reinforces your own beliefs. And that creates kind of like an echo, this is called an echo chamber, where it's like, whatever you say gets repeated back to you. And we want to try and break through that. And so what United Politics attempted to do, um, I think we did rather successfully, is to host events on some pretty controversial topics. Um, I think our second one was abortion. So we kind of went straight for it. <laughs> we weren't trying to kind of start with some easier, you know, maybe, you know, like, child care reform, the things that might be a little more palatable for people across the aisle. We, we went for the divisive stuff because we wanted to do that work of having hard conversations um, without the intention of creating necessarily um, consensus, but rather to create more of an understanding about why people believe what they do. And so part of our process is we do three rounds of speed date where you spend 10 minutes talking to one individual 
Um, you kind of take turns speaking and asking questions. Uh, and your questions can't be critical, so they have to be curious questions, is what we call them, where it's like, oh, I heard you explain that uh, you had a relative who, let's say, uh, you know, worked at Planned Parenthood. Can you tell me more about how that, you know, shaped your belief about uh, abortion? And so it, it meant to kind of get more at the heart of why people believe what they believe. You still might not agree with the conclusion they end at, but you now have an understanding that, okay, given your life experiences, information you've been receiving, I kind of get where you're coming from now. And if I was in your place, I might be saying the same exact thing. Um, and so we've had a lot of really great conversations uh, start in these meetings and then continue past uh, our meetings and people would continue these conversations, which I think for me was really uh, an awesome outcome of our organization. And so basically we would just, you know, every month maybe host one or two conversations and then uh, we also then looked at two after the first few meetings, like, like I said earlier, you know, who's been attending, who's not been attending, and how can then we shape and reflect our, our conversations to be more inviting and inclusive so that way we get a more robust conversation. Um, and the nice thing, too, is that you could be someone who's conservative, talking to someone else who's conservative, and you're going to find out that you might not agree on the same thing. And so even if you had a group that was maybe a little more labelized one way or the other, you still would have actually some really good, robust conversations. And that's what I think was really exciting about our, our organization, our club, is that no matter who was there or what the topic was, you still left learning something about yourself and about others. I have a follow-up question for you, and then I'll take um, a question from Amber in the chat. And if, if there are other folks that have questions, please throw them in the chat. Um, we'd love to get to them. So my follow-up question for you based on what you just shared. Um, I think for some of us on, on this panel, imagining two people on a topic like abortion sitting down and talking seems very difficult. Like there would just be a lot of yelling. How did you guys do it? What, what was the difference you think? I mean, that was one of our concerns when we first started was how do we, in some ways, not be too, uh, too dictating about like how the tone needs to be set. I think emotions are real and emotions can definitely be acknowledged. Uh, but we, before every meeting, we always start with kind of a, our, our, what we call our code, um, where it's like, this is what, if you're going to be part of this conversation, you're agreeing to this code, which is to, again, be curious, not critical, uh, seek to understand, not sure to always be understood. Um, and so we, we came in being very clear, well, like, this is what this space is for. If you're looking to yell at someone or to win, um, that's not what we're all about. Uh, and again, like emotions are real. We, not intentionally, we had a conversation about the Second Amendment the day after the Parkland shooting um, in 2008. I think that was, yeah, 2018. Um, that event was planned, you know, weeks in advance, but it was really raw for a lot of people uh, to talk about Second Amendment issues when you had a, you know, a horrific mass shooting just the day before. And so, Surprisingly enough, though, that was probably one of our best conversations because uh, I think a lot of folks come into it with an open mind and a willingness to listen to each other. And I think everyone left to know that this was an issue that no matter where you were on the political spectrum, you cared about and you wanted to solve. You might disagree again on how we want to solve it, but we did recognize it as an issue. And so I think that was one way, too, that you can really uh, kind of blunt maybe some of the emotion and frustration and anger is by, again, just diving into learning about someone else and not so much of validating or trying to affirm your own beliefs. Um, again, not only successfully, we did have some issues, uh, you know, where again, maybe some individuals uh, said certain things or felt uh, like they were being judged, um, but that's where myself and other folks who are part of the club leadership would step in to try and help uh, just kind of mediate any issues um, while still having the people talk to each other instead of us. So yeah, it was great. It was an issue, but I think at the same time, we, we found a good way to handle it. And in part, that's due to the folks who came to our events being willing to embrace that code that we kind of set forth. Yeah, that's awesome. There's a mutual understanding of the code so you can have some productive conversations. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to get a question from Amber. She's asking, in your opinion, does social media do more harm politically in spreading misinformation or is there a benefit to social media and how do you see 
uh, the next gen Politico is changing that online engagement. Lucas, I'll go to you. Uh, sure. Yeah, I I plan on I definitely plan on touching on this at some point recently because obviously one of the most uh, you could say obvious differences with Gen Z is our participation in things like social media. Um, I think the way that it should be looked at is almost as something that's been it's been constantly developing, right? It's only something that's been around for the net, like really, really been around for the last ten, maybe fifteen years if you're pushing it. Um, and it's just something that's not fully developed and that's something that we've fully gotten to the point that we like understand. So like you said, there's a lot of things that exist on social media, such as misinformation and disinformation that is very much so very harmful towards how someone actually develops the perspectives, right? Because then they can be developed in perspective off of information that's maybe not necessarily true. Uh, but at the same time, it also is um, objectively uh, a good thing because yes, we do have access to more information. We do have access to more experiences. We have access, we have access to more perspectives. We have access to more people. We can talk to more people. We can develop our conversations. We can hold discussion using social media as a tool. I mean, even right now we're on here talking on Zoom, uh, having the discussion on this platform alone. And that's what the same kind of idea that social media can provide. But it's it's like I said earlier, it does exist in the, in the way that it is, it is a double-edged sword that there can be avenues of mis and disinformation that can be detrimental. But I kind of tied that back into my previous point that when you're evaluating information and you're seeing these headliners and these one-liners that exist on social media to almost take it with a grain of salt, right? To take it as, okay, so I don't know hundred percent where this information is coming from. Let me do my due diligence and let me do my independent responsibility to do further research into this topic to actually fully understand and comprehend this issue as a whole before I get married to this idea. Do you think then Gen Z is um, consuming social media and let's throw our news media in there um, more critically than other generations? Because that's one of the big issues we've had in the last couple of elections, right? The, the misinformation on Facebook, on Twitter. So how are you guys doing it differently? <laughs> Brendan, is that a, is that a you, you want to ask to Lucas because I feel like he's much more knowledgeable about this than I am. I just know his work and his background. Um, you know, I, I think in some ways, again, being a more educated generation, you'd hope, right, that we would maybe be a little more critical about the news sources that we read and where we, you know, are getting our information from. I think it's still a little too early to tell, um, in part because in some ways, this is kind of going back to the earlier question that, that Lucas, I think, answered very well. Uh, information has been democratized in a lot of ways. It's easier for misinformation to spread. It's easier for any information really to spread. Um, in some ways, too, we're more of a internationally aware generation because we are able to, you know, see things that occur, you know, halfway around the world instantly that, you know, maybe 50 years ago might not have been the case. And so I think it's it's really just accelerated the amount of information you can receive. And because there's so much information you can receive, it becomes more taxing to try and weed out what is in fact, you know, credible and what is not. Um, and I think for me, like what I personally look at what sources have been uh, credible over time and have built up that trust that I can have with them. A new source that I find might not be itself non-credible just because it's new, but it doesn't have that historic uh, you know, faith placed in it that you would say the New York Times or the Washington Post or locally Star Tribune. Uh, and so that's why I think for me, it, social media um, and how we engage with it, how we view it, I, I think it's just it's still too early to know for our generation at least how we're going to really handle it because something that we've kind of been surrounded by for most of our lives. Um, versus say somebody who's in their 50s where this has kind of been more of a phenomenon for just you know, maybe one third of their life. All right, Lucas, thoughts from you? Yeah, all, all from my perspective, almost from a on the ground perspective, um, being that I am a college student at an undergrad university right now, um, I'll definitely say that the, the overall kind of perception of media, like traditional media sources, like things like Fox, MSNBC, like went sour first, right? So people were looking at things like that and they were like, 
okay, we don't need, we don't like these kind of traditional news sources. And we're very much so going to start looking at these under a critical lens. lens. And it's not like one from one day to the next, like the, the switch just flipped and people started analyzing media more critically. Uh, it's more of just something that kind of happens over the years. And obviously with the explosion of mass information that exists on social media uh, in the last decade, um, I think at first, and especially kind of up to right now, um, people are very much so looked at, at that at face value and under uh, almost an entirely positive light. But I think it's almost at that point where it's like, okay, there is, we're, we are at that point where there's just so much misinformation, so much disinformation that exists that I've started to notice from talking to people um, that, and that their perspective towards social media and, and things like this on social media has started to shift in the sense that, okay, maybe just because this person is putting this out on their story, maybe because this post exists, maybe we should start looking at it a little more critically. Do you, I'm curious, um, what, what social media accounts are you guys going to for any political news? What news outlets are you guys following? Because you mentioned MSNBC, I, I don't think you're watching that, maybe you are. To be curious where you guys are getting your, your source of information. I mean, I'm not a great um, example for this generation, so I'm kind of an old soul at heart. So I still, you know, watch, uh, you know, nightly news sometimes um, at like 5:30 if I'm home. Um, otherwise, I'll have subscriptions to sources like the Star Tribune or other like smaller. Um, New sources like uh, you know Min Post or uh, the Minnesota Reformer, but the other main I say social media source is that you'll just find new stories. Uh, for me, it's Facebook and then YouTube uh, that actually tend to be uh, main places I'll get information from. Um, a lot of times on YouTube, it's it's usually more of uh, established news sources. So sometimes it's kind of more comedic, like The Daily Show um, or like Late Night with Seth Meyers, or it's uh, more of a deep dive into a topic, uh, say like John Oliver will sometimes do, um, where I'm learning more about a single issue. Uh, it's not maybe necessarily a specific current event of what's happened this last day. Uh, but for me, that's where I tend to go. I think comedy itself and how we get news from comedy has been really fascinating, uh, how that's maybe changed over the last few years. Um, I don't know. I don't really have much of an academic uh, insight into why that might be. But I do know that for a lot of people my age, that does tend to be a main uh, avenue where they get their news. When you are an old film, Shannon said, thanks for supporting local news. Agreed. Lucas, how about you? How, where are you getting your information these days? Uh, I'd say with uh, kind of my area of academic study and then also my professional line of work, I very much so, um, it's very important for me to actually stay caught up on topics and rather to uh, kind of more absorb them via informal institutions talking about them. So I, I very much so am trying my best to read articles. I, I don't watch, I will say this, I think this is reflective of many other people in my age group also as well. I don't watch the news at all. I don't turn on uh, any news channels at night and say, this is what I'm gonna watch. Uh, but I do read a lot and I, and I do get a lot of articles and updates on my phone, which is something that's different too, is I don't have magazines, I don't have newspapers. I'm getting live updates on my phone all the time where I'll get a headline, it'll be a one-liner with the name of the article and then I can just swipe and I can read through it. Um, a lot of my, as I was previously noting too, before I got a little sidetracked there, is uh, a lot of my area of focus very much so more focuses on sort of international issues. Um, so ideas like Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, uh, Associated Press, Reuters, BBC, uh, kind of more uh, areas like that. Um, specifically with, um, because of left, middle, right, I'm sort of more turned into having to actually watch uh, more partisan news networks, um, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. But I think as uh, my myself and a lot of my coworkers will sort of um, say towards that is it, it, it's, it's almost hard to watch, you know, like you're trying to watch them and you're just trying to figure out what's going on and what are all these issues that are happening. But it's just, there's just too much else that's going on at the same time. It's hard to find the objectivity in it. Um, but I will say that, um, Lost my train of thought. Sorry. I, I will say that uh, <laughs> as a whole, as a whole, it's it's even when I'm looking at more of the international things and there's less of the domestic players that are involved. Uh, I, I think it's very important to critically and analytic and analytically read everything. I know we touched on this earlier, but um, it's really just it, it's important to know that like every every writer, every organization has some sort of implicit bias that that 
um, exists within it. And like that can objectively or subjectively be good by your own definitions or say a societal definition, but just being aware of that in general, just say that you're understanding where this is coming from is just very much so uh, just an important thing to be aware of. Well, because I think um, you're right on. It's, it's being aware, right? Because sometimes we'll read things to reinforce our own beliefs and we don't even know we're doing it. But um, I'm glad that you guys are recognizing that already. Um, feel free to ask, uh, plug in more questions in the chat. I'm going to be keep plugging away at questions here, but would love to um, have more questions from the audience if we have them. Um, I'm curious to hear from you guys. What do you guys think makes Gen Z, well, I'll phrase it this way. Do you think Gen Z is better at biting the middle than other generations and why? Again, it's tough when we think about Generation Z because we, <laughs> we're still relatively young and we don't yet know really who we are. Um, we're still trying to figure that out. And that's the exciting thing, I think. Uh, there's a lot of promise. And so in some ways, I, I don't know if we actually are better at finding the middle. Um, and I think in part that's because of the environment that we've grown up in. Uh, again, I go back to the Gallup poll that shows that Generally, Americans do not uh, have a lot of faith in government. And I think a lot of that faith has been lost because we've seen a lot of things that might seem like common sense, you know, solutions or issues that really aren't, uh, you know, they really don't have that much of a divisiveness to them, become divisive uh, due to political power grabs um, by both parties trying to win an election, but not to actually implement policy that will help people. And so I, I think in some ways growing up in that environment, uh, that, that that leaves an impression on you. And so I, in some ways, am a little concerned that when we look at, for example, people who are part of Generation Z, that there is more of a unyielding nature to us in terms of our views. Um, I don't think that that is necessarily going to be the case forever. Um, but at the same time, I think there is examples that we've seen out there uh, where in some ways it, it can be very uncompromising. And again, that, that can be taken as good and bad. I think there's some things, especially when it comes to human rights and human dignity, that you really don't want to compromise on and you shouldn't. Um, but I think there, there are times when compromise can be good and there's times when compromise um, can really kind of erode at your soul. And so I just think that right now it's still too early to know I am hopeful. And I think my experience with college possible college possible and yeah, politics, college possible is where I work. But you know, I have politics and college possible working with youth. I do have hope um, because I do think that they, people do care and they do want to listen to each other and they do want to coexist with each other. And so I'm optimistic, but right now I think it's a little too soon to know yet. I'm uh, just considering the environment we've grown up in, what will be our style of politics? In shaped right now. Um, Lucas, I, I want to hear from you, and then I'm going to go to a question from, from Ben. So thoughts on you on, um, will Gen Z be better at finding the middle ground? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, where the sense of Brendan, I'm going to look at it uh, a little more critically, where it's like, are we necessarily better? Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. And I'm really going to tie this back into, just because it's a it's kind of a golden boy example of uh, the idea of social media, right? Where it's like, at, on one hand, yes, like the, the Gen Z can very much so be what way more well equipped um, to and it, because we have so much access, we have so much information available to us, and we can see all of these different perspectives and sort of like average out these perspectives and find a solution in the middle and we can come to a compromise. But at the same time, when there are, you know, that again, I refer back to that double edged sword when when we do have access to do just that much information, we can't necessarily be an expert on everything that is going on. So when we're doing that, we're, we're almost making misinformed opinions, making misinformed decisions and voting on things that we might not necessarily 100% know about. And that can be conflicting because then you might be voting on something where it's, it's just because this group did better job advertising their points and their arguments and you missed out on this group. Now you've got this other population of people who were completely underrepresented in terms of your vote, right? So, so with that, it's, it's very hard. You know, it's very hard to find somewhere in the middle. I think um, just kind of touch on it is that I am very much so just like Brendan, uh, he said, I really like that he said this because not many, not many of us are optimists these days, but I am optimistic that in the future, 
things like social media can turn into something positive where there are a lot of negative attributes, but it's something that can be worked out over time. And eventually that massive amount of information can be sifted through healthily and critically. I love that. I think, um, I think all of us need to hear the optimism that you guys have for us. Um, here's the last question from Ben. I want to read it for you guys. There's a lot of research around trust, but fundamentally we see a stratification based on political ideology and what media institutions Americans trust. Hopefully I'm reading that right. So given your role as the next generation, how do you build back trust in traditional institutions? Does it matter? Is it too late? That's a big question. I'll start with uh, the last part. Is it too late? No, um, I don't believe so. I don't think it's ever too late. Because uh, I, again, maybe often this said nature, I, I think there's still, again, our generation is, is still growing and defining itself and it's still very impressionable. Um, and so I, I do think there's definitely room for it to uh, be a little bit more, I guess, uh, I think there's room for us to have more trust uh, in traditional institutions and with each other. Um, and, I, and I said, because I know I do. I initially, you know, there's times in my life where I was not very uh, excited about talking to someone who maybe didn't have the same belief system or views on political issues as I do. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Um, my experience with United Politics and working with youth has helped me just kind of, again, be more I guess reaffirmed in the value of communication, understanding, and disagreeing, but in agreeable ways. Uh, when it comes to, I think, just building trust, though, into our institutions, I think it goes back to, again, the, the conversation that Lucas and I were talking about, about leaders. Uh, it's essential to reach out to people and invite them in. Um, if someone doesn't trust you, uh, think about why they don't. Be curious. Learn. Like, well, if, I was an elected representative and part of the population I'm serving doesn't trust me. I want to know why. Um, and then I want to work with them and figure out how I can build trust with them. I don't think anyone would want to be in a position where, you know, half the people you serve uh, think you're a liar or think that you don't care about them. Um, again, this is my personal values. I know that wouldn't be the case. And so I, I think it's kind of right now upon a lot of our leaders to be those examples, be those role models for us to, you know, kind of show us how that can be done. Um, and I think there's a lot that they can learn from young people about how we're trying to do it, you know, in a more informal person by person basis, uh, because we've seen it work. And so I think that's, that's kind of my, my thoughts on how we can you know, build trust across, you know, different communities, across different ideologies. Um, again, it doesn't mean you have to have agreement on every issue. But at least a mutual understanding that we care about each other. Again, I'll go back to the first thing I said about uh, my graduate programs, you know, motto in a sense, politics is the way we care for each other. And so I'll really communicate that because I think right now, I uh, understandably, a lot of the nation believes that one side doesn't care about them at all, and the other side thinks the other side doesn't care about them at all. And so how do we go about fixing that? Um, I think that's upon our generation to maybe show how we can. I'll say Brandon Lucas, closing thoughts from you. Uh, absolutely. I really like Brendan going back to the, the politics how is how you care for each other. I really like that saying. Um, in terms of the, I'll start in the same kind of uh, angle that Brendan did. It, is it too late? It's not too late. Um, there's periods of progression in, in all natural uh, phases and there's periods of progression. And it's just, it's natural for those ups and downs to currently be done, happening, but eventually you end up on the upward scale. Um, in terms of trust, it is very hard to establish trust. Trust takes, it takes years, it takes generations, it takes a long time to actually get people to fundamentally trust their institutions. And as we can see right now, a lot of the traditional institutions that we were trusting for a while, things like media, uh, traditional sources of media has, you could say, or you could argue has failed many Americans. And, Ameri and whether or not they objectively failed, Americans are responding that they don't feel like they can trust these institutions. So they turn to other options. They look for other alternatives. They turn to things like social media and social media served that place for them for a number of years, um, but social media is still a rapidly changing, rapidly evolving thing. And I think kind of the just overall human nature, human intuition uh, and human uh, innovation and really just finding these solutions to these problems will take the forefront and all things as it does in medicine, science, technology, in the same way that it will in terms of, say, 
uh, democratic principles or just trust in institutions where people will find that they don't have it right now, there will eventually be a solution or there will be a way for people to come back on that, that sort of that sort of path to building trust in these institutions in the long term. And you guys are leading the way. Thank you both so much for, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I love that you are both optimistic and hopeful. That is what we need right now. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Shannon, I'll toss it back to you to close this up tonight. Awesome. Thank you, guys. This has been fabulous. Um, it's everything I hoped it would be. And wow, the, the questions uh, from our audience were not softballs. <laughs> those were hard questions. Um, so congratulations on, on taking those pitches. Um, so again, thank you to our panelists, to Bua for moderating the discussion. Um, I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat. The first one is the events page on our website. We have finished the first round of Emerging Ideas events for this year. We're going to be back with more in January. We're in our second season. Um, but in the meantime, we do have more conversation opportunities um, later in October and into November. So those are the opportunities. They're sort of like open mic um, to hear about what Majority in the Middle is doing and how you can participate in it. And then we want to hear from you. Um, what are the issues that you're concerned about? What are you thinking about? Um, we also have two uh, of those conversations, one that is specific for members of the business community. Politics is starting to uh, affect the business community in a way that it hasn't in a long time. So one for that. And then one specifically for lobbyists um, who have a especially hard job when partisanship takes hold. Um, I also, before we go, need to make a pitch for financial support to majority in the middle. Um, we are a 501c3 uh, public charity. And like I mentioned at the top of the program, we are a very young organization. We're gonna have our first birthday next week. Uh, turns out starting up a nonprofit is an expensive endeavor. So every dollar helps us do things like file government registrations and trademarks and paying the Zoom bill so we can host events like this. So if you are in a position to donate, please do and thank you. 